Today's video is one that is particularly close to my heart, as you guys all know how much I love Figment and his main man, Dreamfinder. I've gone to conventions, theme parks, even a cruise ship, dressed as Dreamfinder with my puppet pal Figment, and everywhere I go, I leave a trail of rainbow and joy. That's because Figment is an iconic character from the Disney parks with a cult-like following. An original character created specifically for the parks, he has lived on to become everything we want Epcot to be. So naturally, people have a very deep connection with him. But does anyone have a solid understanding of who this 123-year-old dragon really is? Well, today, I'm gonna answer that question. I am going to dig deep into the canonical lore of Figment the Dragon and tell you his entire story. I've combed through comic books, theme park lore, ride videos, and the history of Epcot to bring you a complete timeline of my favorite purple imaginary dragon named Figment. Buckle up, folks. You have no idea how much this dragon has done. And before we start, make sure to subscribe, like, leave a comment, and turn on those notifications. This video is also sponsored by our patrons. Thanks for all of your support over there on Patreon. Without it, we wouldn't be able to make big mega projects like this. The earliest piece of Figment lore actually comes from Marvel, believe it or not. In the early 2010s, after Disney had acquired Marvel, they started a little run of comics that explored theme park lore called Disney Kingdoms. They looked into things like the Haunted Mansion and Big Thunder Mountain, and more importantly for this video, Figment. The Figment series started with a five-issue run and explored the history of Dreamfinder, Figment, and I guess, the power of imagination, right? <laughs> so let's jump into this story and find out how it all began in London, 1910. Welcome to the Academy Scientifica Lucidius, where a young and ambitious inventor named Blarian Mercurial experiments with the energy of the mind with this integrated mesmonic converter. However, after several failed tests, Chairman Illicrant threatens to expel Blarian from the Institute if he does not find some new form of energy. This is a constant struggle for our young creative hero, who has spent a majority of his life dealing with both poverty and being a little too inventive. While refining the spark converter further one day, he accidentally brings to life an imaginary friend named Figment. Here it is. Here is the birth of the idea of Figment all the way back in 1910. Figment is just pure joy at this point. He spends a majority of his time asking questions and absorbing all kinds of information from the books scattered throughout the workshop. And of course, encouraging Blair to always use his imagination. Unfortunately, Blarian continues to be under a lot of pressure from Chairman Illicrand, which forces the inventor to think bigger and better. He succeeds, more or less, and opens up an interdimensional portal using thought energy, which then sucks up Figment and Blarian. The helmet of this thing, man. It looks like an owl. It's, I guess it's supposed to imply like knowledge because owls are supposed to be wise. And so this kind of like this wisdom imagination device. I, I'm very fascinated by this helmet. And this helmet is super important to the entire Figment comic run. The first issue of the comic book really sets up the idea of steampunk Dreamfinder. We're very familiar from that in the ride from the 80s, but this is really establishing that canon that he is very much a tinkerer. He is very, very smart. And it's not just about imagination. He has like real engineering talent. Now we're on issue two, where Figment and Blarian emerge on the other side in the psionic dimension. The new dimension is suddenly hit with a massive storm as Blarian considers the environment, causing a brainstorm. Meanwhile, back at the Institute, Chairman Illicrant uses the converter helmet to control the portal, but inadvertently summons a mechanical claw. The singular, the leader of the clockwork control, comes out of the portal and attacks Illicrant. After retreating to a cave to hide from the brainstorm, Blarian and Figment encounter this giant flying pink dog creature called the Chimera. 
as they befriend it, they are suddenly surrounded by sound sprites. The sound sprites have a special ability where they can manifest matter from sound. And with that power, they capture the group. The psionic dimension is wild. It's got very much like Avatar, you know, Land of Pandora energy. Everything's like colorful and pink and blue and glowy and magical. I really, really love it. I think it's really cool. We don't spend nearly enough time here. And this dog, this flying dog thing has like never ending story energy, you know? Like I love a, I love a flying magical dog. And this one's so cute. It's odd. It's definitely odd. A lot of the, a lot of the original characters in this comic run are, are odd. I love some of the artwork though. Like some of the artwork is really fun. You look at the main covers of these comic books and the, and the, and these like promo arts and you're just like, oh yeah, absolutely. I don't know what's going on there, but it looks exactly like what Dreamfinder and Figment would be up to. This almost looks like a poster you would see in, in the queue of the original ride. Let's continue to issue three, where the sound sprites are part of a group called the Audio Archipelago. The sprites suggest that the pair are discordant to their melodies and detain them. They meet an imperfect sprite named Phi the Flaw, who is also discordant to their melody. You see there's a pattern developing here. Meanwhile, back at the Institute, the Singular uses the helmet on Illicrant to summon his articulate army. The violence on which this mechanical singular monster like slams the helmet on the old chairman man, there's like a thunk. <laughs> I just want to say here real quick that the singular is like this combination of like Hal from Space Odyssey, like that that terrifying steering wheel and Wally, -E, and that weird robot that Syndrome makes that's unstoppable for killing superheroes. It's got a lot of like it's it's really got a lot of evil energy in this thing, man. Meanwhile, back in the psionic dimension, Blarian realizes he can manifest his thoughts and creates a key to escape where the big pink thing comes and helps them escape. That big dog, man, it's always wherever it needs to be this entire issue run. It's, <laughs> I love it. It's like the Eagles in Lord of the Rings. As the group escapes the audio archipelago, they are caught by the nightmare nation. Yeah, the Nightmare Nation gets some, ooh, like, oh, I love this one. I love this one. It's like, it's got all of like that, like 80s, 90s, like magician energy that I love. Cause Dreamfinder's kind of like a corny birthday magician if you think about it. Now to the second last issue, issue four, Blarian, Phi, Figment, and the Pink Dog are stuck in the Nightmare Nation's clouds, which torment each of them in their own unique ways. The torment and self-doubt of Blarian causes Figment to phase out of existence. That's crazy. Dreamfinder has an anxiety attack that's so strong it makes his imaginary friend die. I can like feel that in my chest. It's like kind of like moving in a way. Because self-doubt's a real thing. We are all Dreamfinder. You know, like my imposter syndrome on this whole journey has been wild. We, there's a little bit of Dreamfinder's doubt in all of us because it's what comes with imagination, right? And just when all hope seems lost, Blarian is visited by this tiny little purple orb. It's Figment's spark, his imagination. Blarian reclaims his imagination and is transformed into the Dreamfinder. I love this moment. It's such a cool moment. Cause here you would have thought that the dream finder was just blaring all along, but no, he had to go through that journey of losing all hope and then refinding that one little spark of imagination to make him the hero that everyone loves. Dreamfinder then uses his newfound magic to blast through the nightmare nation, freeing his friends. Just as they return to London, they find it in ruins. The Clockwork Army has taken over the city, leaving it burning. This is great. This 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 cover is like it's like business time, you know? It's like I'm I'm Dreamfinder. All right, for the final issue of Figment. The team makes their way to the rooftops of the academy where they encounter the Singular who tries to force Dreamfinder to use the converter. 
But luckily, Figment and the pink dog managed to steal the converter and rescue Illicrant. As Dreamfinder is caught up on the situation, he discovers an idea and hops into a portal. He quickly reappears riding a giant balloon he calls the Dream Machine. There it is. The Dream Machine then begins sucking up the entire Clockwork Army and begins turning their parts into tools and weapons for the townspeople to use in defense. The Singular attacks Dreamfinder, who uses the opportunity to hop through another portal, sealing the Singular, Figment, and Dreamfinder in another dimension. So the story wraps up in a pretty interesting way. Dreamfinder is sucked into, you know, danger portal to save the day. And the chairman, he recognizes Blarian's sacrifice, makes sure Blarian's family is well supported. And the issue ends with Dreamfinder and Figment on the dream machine, arriving at what looks like the swamps of Florida. As he says, imagination is our key to unlock the hidden wonders of the world. I had a lot of fun with this first Figment run. It's a little interesting who the audience is specifically. Are they going after kids? Are they going after teens or perhaps an adult comic audience? Uh, the theme parks themselves have a pretty wide, uh, wide spread in terms of who enjoys the parks. But this uh, feels a little dark. It feels a little edgy. But uh, I think it has a pretty general audience. I think a lot of people could read this and have a really great time. And I don't think it steps on any toes at the parks. It gives us a really interesting idea of where Dreamfinder came from, that he is not just a dreamer, but he's also very skilled in uh, in engineering and mechanics and, and, and building things. Very similar to a lot of the scientists we'll later see take hold of Dreamfinder's space in the, in the parks. He's not just some crazy guy who likes to think about arts in literature, he's a very accomplished scientist. Hey, you've been watching The Timeline of Figment. We'll be right back. The Magic Candle Company brings the vacation to you. Head on over to magiccandlecompany.com and use coupon code DisneyDan15 to take 15% off all of your favorite theme park smells. From your rides, to your resorts, to some of your favorite foods, every one of those theme park smells is there. Magiccandlecompany.com, coupon code DisneyDan15. Here's where things get a little weird as we approach Figment 2, which was released in 2016 as a follow-up to the first five issues. Now we have another five issues taking Figment and Dreamfinder on another whole new adventure. Now the second book picks up exactly where we left off from the first run. Dreamfinder and Figment flying through the air together as a team to a new mysterious place. They land at the new Florida campus of Academy Scientifica Lucidius after experiencing some significant engine trouble. Inside the giant academy, they find a huge statue honoring themselves. The new chairman arrives as the two begin to draw a lot of attention, accusing them of being imposters. Luckily, an elderly Phi, the sound sprite, arrives to verify that it is indeed Dreamfinder and Figment. And a hundred years have passed. Here's what's interesting. A giant geodesic sphere has appeared approximately 30 years ago, and the research team has been studying it as a power source, a renewable power source. Dreamfinder offers his power of imagination and mental thought, but his dream machine isn't operating properly and crashes. Like, right into the darn thing. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure, right? He crashes it right into Spaceship Earth. Yeah, he smashes it right into the sphere. <laughs> I love that so much. Luckily, Phi has saved the Mesmonic Converter after all of these years and offers them to try it again. Dreamfinder has doubt that this will work. He doubts that he'll be able to fit into this modern society. And here is where we see the shadow of doubt behind Dreamfinder. In issue two, Dreamfinder continues to fall into despair on staying a relevant and accomplished inventor. He is standoffish towards Figment's optimism, which is uh, not a good sign. Red flags, Dreamfinder. Phi takes Dreamfinder and Figment to the auditorium where they are to demonstrate the Mesmonic Converter. 
the Mesmodic Converter fails to work, and Dreamfinder continues to slip into doubt. Trying a second time, the geodesic sphere suddenly vanishes in a blast of green light. Spaceship Earth be doing that sometimes. <laughs> It almost disappeared for three years for renovations that never happened. God bless. As Dreamfinder is blamed for the missing power source, his doubt overwhelms him and bursts from his chest. Doubt then attacks Figment, Phi, the staff, completely taking over Dreamfinder and turning him into the Doubt Finder. Figment barely escapes the Academy, flying quickly up and out into the Florida sky. At the Academy, Doubt Finder has possessed every member. Meanwhile, as a prologue to each one of these issues in Figment 2, we're introduced to this young child character who's very handy, has an imaginary friend she calls Spark, and uh, sort of reminds us of a certain iconic character, but we can't quite put our finger on it. She lives in a beach town in Florida, of all places, and uh, we kind of establish that she's, you know, the black sheep of the family with her, with her crazy inventive thinking. Issue three of the comic begins with Figment lost in the swamps of Florida, looking for some sort of hope when he comes upon the small town of Coco. There he finds a bright light of imagination in the top floor of a residential house. He's just cruising through the neighborhood and finds a lighthouse of imagination. Inside, Figment meets a young genius inventor named Capri. She has a huge imagination and is quite the tinkerer. She has applied to go to the academy, but has been rejected over and over, even though she herself is the great, great, great grandniece of the Dream Finder himself. Remember that family in the first run that was poor and needed help? Well, looks like they were taken care of very well by chairman because they uh, retired in Florida. There in her bedroom, her imagining up great big things is what drew Figment towards her. Figment and Capri join forces after she learns what is going on and claims that it is her destiny to save Dreamfinder. They head out into the night together on a bike, traveling back to the Academy, making a plan to steal back the Mesmonic Converter. They sneak back into the Academy to find its students and staff drenched in a green fog of doubt. The Doubt Finder feeds off of their insecurities with the goal of using the fear fog to bring the Nightmare Nation to Earth. There it is again, the Nightmare Nation has made its return. Capri and Figment steal the Mesmonic Converter helmet and are chased by Doubt Finder until Capri puts on the helmet, allowing her own magical companion to take form, Spark, a rhyming dragon cat. They face off with Doubtfinder, and Capri uses the helmet to blast him with imagination, creating a portal that leads into the heart of Doubtfinder himself. Issue four. The trio is dropped deep inside Dreamfinder's doubt, taking us through his painful childhood memories. First, we go to Dreamfinder's school, where as a child, he would daydream and doodle, but doubt enters the memory and overwhelms the child. Figment, Capri, and Spark continue to find a massive labyrinth of Dreamfinder's mind. Inside, we find all of his self-doubt, reflecting on all of his failures. A storm of doubt forms around the three as they are attacked by more harmful thoughts. As Capri and Spark are sucked away into the tornado, Figment sees Dreamfinder in the eye of the storm, completely destroyed, given up all hope. Figment tries to reason with him, gives him hope, but nothing works. The dragon vanishes into a flash of purple doubt. Capri, carried by a brightly glowing spark, determined to make her uncle see, shouts to him about all the good he has done and how it only takes one little spark to be great. Spark's light shines bright as an evidence of Capri's love and inspiration her uncle provides. The spark of Figment reappears, reminding Dreamfinder of his empathy, his courage, his ingenuity and conviction, his purple spark, his legacy. The sky clears and his spell is broken. Once again, he is Dreamfinder. They return to the Academy to find Doubt no longer needs a host. He is about to escape the Academy and take over the world. 
Doubt immediately attacks the group, trying to recapture the converter helmet for himself. A game of keep away is played by each member of the team, except for Capri, who throws on the helmet and imagines a dream cycle that allows her to escape the clutches of doubt. I don't know, the Dreamfinder family is equipped like Batman, man. When there is a gadget they need, they just imagine it. This thing is ridiculous. <laughs> But Capri's mom arrives, distracting her, causing her to lose the helmet. But Dreamfinder catches it just in time. But before he can put it on, he realizes that imagination is for everyone. It isn't just for him. And he smashes the helmet, releasing a powerful blast of dream energy that releases the hold doubt has on the students and staff of the academy. With their minds free to imagine again, and charged up with the dream power from the smashed helmet, suddenly a huge army of imagined creatures appear, all ready to defeat Doubt. Figment leads the charge of imaginary friends as they pour into the Doubt monster and it explodes. Whoa. The Academy welcomes Capri as a student for helping save the day and offers Dreamfinder a resident professor position, which he declines. He has a new mission. He wants to investigate where that sphere might have disappeared to. Ooh, yeah, where did that sphere go? Together with Figment, he reimagines the dream machine back in working order, and they take off into the sky, reminding Capri that they'll always be there for her in her dreams. Figment 2 played with the art style that we saw in the first issue run. It got a little bit rounder, a little bit softer, a little bit brighter, and it definitely became more of a, a kid-focused comic. Ultimately, it was an interesting story. It was an interesting trying to tie in like the Epcot Center uh, and the and you know the geodesic sphere. But unfortunately, this was the end of the Figment comic runs. We haven't received another addition to this Figment series, so there's no real telling what happened. So canonically, little is known about what Figment and Dreamfinder got up to after saving the Academy from doubt. At least what we know now is that the sphere now resides at Epcot Center in the swamps of Florida. So I imagine whatever they were out there trying to do in finding the sphere that disappeared, they were successful. Now you have to understand about this experimental prototype community is that they had all these pavilions to give you an idea of what the future might be like, what technology might be like, and of course, what imagination has in store, all the powers of imagination. It was a world's fair, not just for nations and uh, science, but also for ideas, for imagination. And Dreamfinder had a really good idea on what to do with the Academy Scientifica Lucidius, transform it into the Imagination Pavilion. He kind of took us on a tour of imagination. It's kind of genius. And on the tour, Dreamfinder introduces the public to Figment through song. And we join him high in the sky on his dream machine. It's really, it's, it's an incredible piece of technology. It can fly. It's got blimps and lights and all kinds of gizmos and whistles. I love this thing. Together with Figment, we enter into the dream port where all ideas are sorted and stored. Figment helps us journey through all kinds of things like art, literature, performing arts, and science, showing us how imagination can dream up all sorts of wonderful new things. Dreamfinder reminds us that imagination is the key to unlocking all of the hidden wonders of the world. We see him sitting behind a film camera as Figment is seen in multiple clips of all sorts of professions. I love this ride. It's a very contained bit of Figment experience and it's more so just Dreamfinder and Figment meeting the public because up until this point, they've been doing nothing but adventuring and now they're kind of like, you know, taking residency inside of the Imagination Pavilion to really interact introduce and educate everyone about just what imagination can do. I never got a chance to ride the original tour of imagination uh, hosted by Dreamfinder. Uh, I never got to journey into imagination with him, unfortunately. Yeah, the ride was long closed by the time I was really, you know, into Epcot. For like 15, 16 years, Dreamfinder and Figment roamed around Epcot Center in front of the Imagination Pavilion, meeting and interacting with guests. It was truly an amazing time. 
Usually kids were way more entertained with Figment to actually really, you know, interact with Dreamfinder, but my gosh, some really, really great moments. Really, really great moments. I love Dreamfinder being a resident of Epcot. It just made that whole corner of the park feel alive. In this video, I'm just focusing on the canon of Figment. I'm not exactly focusing on all of Figment's attractions, but don't worry, there's going to be a full evolution of Figment video coming in your YouTube feed very soon. Dreamfinder was such an iconic resident of Epcot, in fact, that he showered it with gifts all the time. In 1985, Dreamfinder had this genius idea to fill the skies of Epcot with rainbows in the special event that he would call Skaleidoscope. This was an amazing gift by Dreamfinder, of course. His dream machine and all of his powers of imagination and colors and art and music and sound. Who wouldn't want to go to a big lagoon festival sponsored by Dreamfinder? But here is the problem. The Nightmare Nation, I can only assume, broke into the lagoon of the World Showcase, preventing Dreamfinder from doing his aerial rainbow show by introducing Ma and Pa Dragon and the Dragonettes, these dragon boats that terrorize the lagoon, breathing fire and preventing Dreamfinder's imagination from taking flight. This was a wild event, guys. This, it was so popular. It was just supposed to happen on the weekends. And before they knew it, they were doing it daily for like two years. People loved this thing. Unfortunately, Dreamfinder didn't eventually make an appearance in the show itself, except in just voiceover and premise because his giant blimp that they were constructing for him could not tolerate the winds of Epcot, could not tolerate the whims of Florida. So if they were trying to try to fly the blimp over Epcot, it would just veer off course most of the time. And so it just wasn't a, a, a viable thing. If you need to find us, we'll be somewhere, somewhere over a But the show was full of jet skis and boats and airplanes with, with rainbow smoke. It was such a cool spectacle. This show was incredibly popular and ran for two years. There was a huge demand for it. And unfortunately it came to a sudden halt after the passing of one of the cast members who were operating the planes during one of the test flights before performance, just like an hour before performance in the afternoon in 87, the plane crashed due to a faulty part and Disney canceled the show and it never really returned. And, and Disney's kind of shied away from doing big aerial stunts like that ever since. It's not something Disney likes to play around with now. Now. And uh, it, it makes me sad, both for the cast member we lost and for all that really wonderful, magical moments that Epcot had that we lost. It's not directly implied that these dragons come from the Nightmare Nation, but now that we have a lot of lore and kind of uh, understanding of Dreamfinder and his nemesis in the Sionic dimension, that uh, it was very much likely the Nightmare Nation that birthed these dragons to attack the lagoon when Dreamfinder was trying to have his big event. Ah, my book! Hi, Andy. Who are you? Why, I'm Figment of the Imagination. <laughs> I live in a magical place called Fagonia. Moving on, in 1988, Figment continued his pursuit of understanding and imagination and the powers of the mind to the fullest by dreaming up a special land he called Fagonia, likely located somewhere near the Dreamport. Here, Figment can tackle some of the larger ideas and concepts of imagination, and he has the ability to summon humans into the bright, colorful home he's imagined to help him think of his great big ideas. The Figonia educational films don't really add a lot to Figment's canon, other than telling us about this new land, Figonia, that he dreamed up. But what it does do is give us uh, the ability to use this character as a lens to teach specific questions using fun rhyming prose and silliness. Behind the scenes, these were VHS educational films made by Disney. They charged schools $350 per VHS to receive each of these individual, uh, you know, substitute teacher videos, essentially. This is what they are. They're videos that substitute teachers play to be like, oh, I don't know what to do, kids. <laughs> Those are my favorite days though. You roll in the AV cart with the VCR on the bottom and the TV strapped to the top and you just you just watch some educational films. 
There were 11 episodes made, which had titles like, Would You Eat a Blue Potato? Reading Magic with Figment and Peter Pan. What's an Abra without a Cadabra? I've watched a bunch of these and I love them. I love the set that they build. I love that like in episodes like Peter Pan or Alice in Wonderland, we get actors dressed up like the characters, almost like you would see in the parks. Figment is sparse in these. It was clear that animation was expensive. And so Figment would talk off screen a lot. And uh, when we did see Figment, he had some very choppy, you know, low frame rate animation layered over top of a lot of live action kids acting and frolicking and having a great time. We can do a whole separate video just diving into these educational films and peeling them apart layer by layer because there truly are some silly things. But in terms of the greater canon, the greater timeline, they don't add much. They don't change much. They just give us a little bit of a peek into Figment. Now, while no one was looking, in 1993, something very important to the timeline happened. The Imagination Institute moved into the Magic Eye Theater located directly next to the Imagination Pavilion to demonstrate some new technology invented by the scientist Wayne Zielinski. Now, the Institute's present isn't important to the timeline now, but it is important to mention because this is when we are first introduced to Dr. Nigel Channing. During the time of the Imagination Institute sneaking into Epcot, Figment was kept quite busy with the array of festivals debuting at Epcot. We had all kinds of festivals. 1994 Flower and Garden Festival, 1996 Food and Wine Festival, the 1996 Festival of Holidays. It was amazing. And the festivals gave Figment an opportunity to learn more about flowers, cooking, art, and the holidays. Here at the parks took time to really make him a resident of the experimental prototype community. Figment was kind of everywhere, became kind of a tiny mascot, a fun nod to the front of the park while we're in the back of the park experiencing the World Showcase. If it was a food festival, you might catch Figment with a chef hat on. This guy could run a Michelin star restaurant for the amount of food festivals Figment has attended. <laughs> If there was a flower festival, you might see Figment in a sun hat and overalls. And of course we got an amazing Figment topiary that came with us through the many years of the Flower Garden Festival. And for the holiday season, you could catch Figment dressed up for Christmas. In fact, Christmas 1996 is when Figment let us all know that he was a practicing Christian. In... <laughs> Oh my God, I feel like this is gonna piss people off. <laughs> but that's, we have to go deep, right? In Christmas 1996, Figment let us all know that he was a practicing Christian by appearing on a celebratory international plate, wearing a Santa hat and carrying jingle bells. But it makes sense, cause he was invented by, you know, like a, a ginger guy from 1910 London. So we definitely knew who Jesus was. Now we come to 1999. Now it's unknown what caused Dreamfinder and Figment to leave the Institute. We have theories. Perhaps the Nightmare Nation had found its way back into our reality again, or perhaps Dreamfinder went off to explore a new world in a, in a, in a brand new expedition. Whatever Dreamfinder was up to, he wasn't around to protect the Imagination Pavilion. And it allowed the Imagination Institute next door to take over the entire space, the entire pavilion, bringing a priority to science over imagination. And we already know what happens when we go down that route, don't we? The entire Dreamfinder tour that he carefully crafted to take us through the entire uh, journey into imagination was gutted, removed, and replaced with an extension of the Institute next door focused on experiments conducted on imagination. You start off in the ride being scanned and they tell you you have no imagination. And then they kind of slowly move you through various experiments where they throw different kinds of stimuli at you to try to inspire imagination inside you. Where at the end you're finally scanned and, it, and they, they, they figure you, they did a good job and they show you a big wall of all kinds of things that you've imagined, but it's very cold. It's very analytical. It's very boring. There's a giant upside down house at the end that didn't do anything for me. I, 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 I don't know. I didn't like this at all. You know what? Nobody did. Well, there is some figment in this ride. The ghost of figment is here. It's almost like the power of Dreamfinder's imagination 
uh, left like remnant energy in the ride that even though they tried to take him out and replace him, Figment still crept up in there. Now they, they showed Figment as being a result of Dr. Nigel Channing's imagination, which I have a little bit of a hard time with because I think that Figment's energy was already in the space and Nigel went in there and was just kind of infected by like the power of the Mesmonic Converter and all the energy that was left there during that battle with doubt that had happened decades ago. So Figment's energy, Dreamfinder's energy has always been there and will always be there. And so Figment made small cameos in the ride. He appeared as a constellation. You could hear his voice here and there. He is in the ride, but he is very clearly uh, been subdued. He's just kind of like haunting the attraction in a way. He's just peeking through the, the cracks. Overall though, nobody liked this ride. And Dreamfinder's Dreamcatcher, that iconic ride vehicle that we all knew and loved, was unceremoniously just stuck in a shopping area in the now defunct Mouse Works. I don't know where his flying ship is today and how Dreamfinder was able to travel around without a ship that's been clearly on display in Epcot Park. Not exactly sure what the deal is. In fact, the ride was so hated that just like two short years after the Imagination Institute's revamp took over, it was closed. It was closed and was retooled into a brand new experience called Journey Into Your Imagination with Figment. When Figment had finally returned to the Imagination Institute to find all of Dreamfinder's hard work gone, he really only had one task. And that task was to bring imagination back to the cold clinical scientific institute using the power of chaotic good. Figment's overhaul of the attraction started with the Q space and worked its way straight to the final number. And this is a new Figment that we're meeting here. He is a changed Figment. I don't know what happened with him and Dreamfinder over the couple of years that they were absent from the park, but this is a new Figment. At this point, he's 92 years old. He's fully entering his troublesome teenage years, obviously. He's one uh, sassy dragon. He's an absolute menace, and he's looking to shake things up and keep imagination at the forefront of everyone's minds. The new Q space of this ride featured a lot of great scientific minds, and it makes me sad that Dreamfinder wasn't featured as one of these scientists, and he's only remembered as a dreamer, because as we know, he's a hardworking engineer, and he belongs on this wall alongside, you know, Wayne Zielinski and uh, Robin Williams' flubber character. Don't remember what his name was, but these guys were hardworking scientists who made great, like, discoveries in imagination, just like Dreamfinder. So it almost kind of feels like a punch in the face for Dreamfinder fans that we got a poster of Nigel to some scientist who moved in next door and, and took over while Dreamfinder was out saving the world. The ride is great though. Nigel introduces us to uh, the sensory labs and tells us that we're gonna go through all of the, the senses and figment. He's got other plans. First, we start in the sound lab, similar to the original revamp of the ride in a dark area, hearing lots of sounds. Then we go to the sight lab where figment hits us with all kinds of fun visual gags in a uh, eye chart board. We see fun magical illusions like a butterfly that disappears. Then we go to the smell lab where Figment hints us with some stink, some stinkiest stink, stink, stink. And here's a fun fact about me, Dan, your favorite YouTuber. I'm a super smeller. So I go into that ride immediately smelling burnt coffee, which is what they use for the skunk. And because of my association with Figment and skunk and burnt coffee, every time I go into a Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks, all I smell now is skunk. So thanks Epcot, thanks Imagineering. I really appreciate that. As the tour tries to continue, Figment's just like, forget this, and he takes over that upside down house that they built at the end of the ride, turning it into Figment's house. And here's something fun, Kenny. Show them the house, but turn it. Whoa, look at this thing, man. It now just looks like a regular house. Oh, yeah, cool. Look at all this cool stuff. Man, I bet you haven't seen it upside down like this before, have you? Neither have I, until now breaks my brain a little bit. 
And I love that finale. And the finale is actually a pretty important thing to bring up here, because as we previously mentioned, Fagonia is this wonderful place full of hot air balloons and clouds, colorful lights and rainbows and boxes and, and ideas. And I feel like the ending of Journey Into Your Imagination with Figment actually takes us to Fagonia. And we get a really good look at Fagonia and the world of Figment. It's a really, really great finale piece. And then of course there's Moonface, Nigel Channing, which I think is an appropriate punishment for trying to take over the Institute. He's banished forever as the man in the moon. Now that is an imaginative way to torture someone, Figment. And, uh, and he, has a, he has a new winter sweater that he wears now sometimes, that's, and that's cool. Figment Figment's often known for being chilly. Now that we're in 2002 and Figment's back in his attraction at the Imagination Pavilion, Epcot kind of got wise to Figment being a integral loved part of the community. And they leaned very heavily into that, starting with a pin celebration, the search for imagination in 2002. It was a little series of pins and they had hats, t-shirts, uh, all, all kinds of fun imagery featuring Figment in this community-wide event throughout the entire park that had Figment going around, searching for imagination and interacting with your favorite Disney characters. I kind of love this. We're really starting to understand that um, the marketing for this park can be fun, can be colorful, can be cool. In 2005, as Figment's popularity regrew in the community, he decided to imagine up something special for everyone who was missing the chance of meeting him like you could do in the early 80s. Figment's Place was a special little spot that they built in Imageworks to debut a brand new meet and greet that Figment imagined up as this larger than life mascot to hang out with all of his fans. And that makes sense, of course, because Figment's lived a long time down there in all of the uh, open communities uh, where there are lots of mascoted characters parading around. So if Figment wanted to become an interactable character out on the streets of the parks, it only makes sense that he would imagine himself as this large than life dragon that could just run all over the place and interact with things. And I uh, honestly, I love him. I love this chunky, chunky, thickness, thick Figment. It's so cute. And I'm gonna consider Figment's place, the area that you could meet him as an annex of Figonia. Kind of like an add on to that cloudy dreamlike land that we saw at the end of the attraction and where he spends a lot of his time uh, investigating the ideas of literature and art. Figonia is a special place and this feels like he just kind of summoned a little bit of it and brought it to us in Imageworks for us to explore and hang out in. I love that. Thanks Figment. Figment sort of took center place for the arts festival's promotional material and inspiration. Remember all the way back to the original Epcot attraction, art was a huge part of imagination. We had a huge segment of the original Dreamfinder tour that explored art and colors and how we use them in art. And so of course, Figment would make the perfect spokesperson for a whole festival dedicated to art. And there was everything for this guy there. They had giant wall paintings where you could make a massive Figment mural. We could search the World Showcase for tons of classical portraits that Figment had imagined himself into. And of course you could grab one of dozens, and I mean dozens of pieces of merchandise that feature Figment alongside any of the many festival logos. I sometimes think, when I can't sleep at night, how Figment would feel knowing that lines of people waited at a grilled cheese stand to get his popcorn bucket. Almost brings a tear to my eye. I'm sure he would love it. This thing, the pinnacle of Figment merch. Actually, that's not true. I'm currently on the hunt for a Figment Big Fig. I found one online for like $3,000 and that's not happening. So if you have any cool Figment merchandise, reach out to me because I think we might do a whole Figment merch episode and uh, if you just got Figment stuff laying around that you don't want anymore, mail it to me. I'll get you a P.O. box right here. It's sort of fun actually, going back all the old festivals, looking at all the old merchandise, checking out all the fun things they did with Figment, all the cute pins, all the Christmas ornaments, all the shirts and postcards and, and prints and promotional material. Figment is super, super cute. And it's interesting that the management of this uh, community of tomorrow has managed to keep interest for Figment rolling for like over a, a, a decade, despite the fact that his attraction is no longer beloved. 
let's just take a quick minute and go back to Dreamfinder and how he's been missing now for decades. There is one prevailing theory on where Dreamfinder is, and it comes from the most unlikely of places. I'm going down to South Park. Going Midway down through South Park. Comedy Central's South Park season 11, in 2007, there was a three part miniseries event called Imagination Land. And at the center of it all was this Dreamfinder character on his giant Dreamfinder balloon. And I kind of like this, even though it was in the imagination of uh, two creators who are in no way, shape, or form affiliated with. Disney in any way, shape, or form. An imagination, imagination, imagination. Are you gonna take us somewhere or not? The idea of Dreamfinder living on in the imagination of others and taking uh, hold of this entire imagination space called Imagination Land is something that really warms my heart. It's not official, but I really like this theory that Dreamfinder has just kind of retired off and is now just at the dream part permanently, taking care of everything that is imagined, chronicling it, inventorying it, and caring for it and loving it. Now there have been sightings of Dreamfinder. I've heard tell that he appeared once mysteriously at a D23 event, only to vanish shortly thereafter and never be seen again. Uh, he's kind of mysterious. Dreamfinder's sort of like Disney Park Sasquatch, you know, like he's, uh, he's aloof. And uh, if you see him now, he doesn't really, you know, look right. It's always a grainy photo or just looks like a YouTuber dressed in some odd cosplay. Now Figment's busy. Figment's been very busy outside of just his known lore in the theme parks. In fact, he's popped up in several places that have been completely unexpected. First and foremost, in Pixar's Inside Out film, we find in her imagination land, a portrait of Figment, which I think is very interesting because I believe this implies that Riley, the character has either been to Epcot and has experienced the entire Figment attraction, or more importantly and more significantly, every child's imagination is somehow combined and interlocked in some mysterious different dimension that is imagination land that connects us all and Figment is somehow its ruler. And when we grow up, we demolish it in our souls and make way for things like cooking recipes and you know, when to take your car and get its oil changed. Just sad things. Another appearance of Figment that I'm particularly fond of is in Toy Story 4. There's a fun arcade called the Dragon Zone, which I love this implication because it means that in this universe, Figment had infected the imagination of at least one arcade owner to the point that he themed an entire arcade off of Figment. I think that's so great. I love that Figment's the star of his own arcade. Because if I had to put money on it, I bet Figment loves an arcade. Oddly enough, uh, on the beast's castle, Figment is featured prominently as one of the gargoyles on the castle. Perhaps one of my favorite Figment Easter eggs though, is his appearance at the Collector's Fortress in Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. In, of course, his collection of everything that the Collector collects, there are lots of different uh, boxes in the queue. And one of the queue boxes in particular features a tiny little purple dragon behind some frosted glass. So I don't know if this is specifically Figment, although it looks very, very much like him. And uh, I don't know how Figment got himself into this predicament and how he found himself so far off in space, but here he is locked up in one of the collector's collections. I don't know what, the, maybe the collector went to Epcot and it was just like, I need one of those. And Dreamfinder's like, here, take one. They keep popping out of my machines. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure, but uh, I like this little moment. And that brings us to some exciting Figment announcements. In fact, I was part of the exciting Figment announcements, if you don't recall. Anyone watching the D23 live stream at the beginning of the Figment segment was greeted with my face. Truly, I like, I, I cried. I like had like, I got like very moved. It was wild. But at that D23 announcement, we got some really, really big news. 
Two big things. Figment's place is returning in some capacity. A Figment meet and greet is coming back to Epcot sometime in the year 2023. I'm not exactly sure what that's gonna look like or how that's going to uh, uh, appear, what the space is gonna be, what the costume is gonna be like, if it even is a costume. Perhaps it might be a puppet, a small puppet of Figment. I'm not exactly sure what Figment's imagination is gonna dream up for this opportunity to meet him, but I'm really looking forward to that. And more importantly, there's a Figment Figment movie coming out. Now, what will this Figment movie be? I just took you through the entire canon of Figment. Every instance he's been dreamed up, thought up, and used by the Disney company to tell stories. And I don't know how we can have a movie about Figment without Dreamfinder. Will this retcon my entire video or will the movie build upon the existing story that we have in the comics and in the rides? I just know that there's only one thing for certain and that if Dreamfinder isn't a part of it, they're gonna have to fundamentally rebuild everything about the character. And I'm not exactly sure how well received that will be because a lot of people have a lot of connections with Figment. They draw a lot of story and a lot of lore and he's connected to a lot of stuff. And I'm not exactly sure if it's gonna be a great move to just kind of retcon the entire character and rebuild him from the ground up. Unless of course that means that we get a Figment renaissance in the parks. And that means a brand new ride, brand new merchandise, brand new experiences. If a new Figment movie that's going to rebirth Figment is received well, it has the potential for Figment to become a massive force in the parks. But that's something to be seen. That's something to find out. It has a really great team behind it, has some really interesting writers, like the guy behind Detective Pikachu, which I thought was super cute and adorable and cuddly. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I have hope. I don't have doubt. I'm not the doubt finder, I'm the dream finder. And I'm certain that Figment's legacy is going to live on and on and on. And while I'm not exactly sure where the dream finder may return, if ever, I know for certain that we have the most amazing purple dragon to give us one little spark of inspiration every time we need it. So that's it. That's the complete canonical history of Figment. Uh, there were a couple of holes there, here and there, that I had to, you know, plug up with some of my own theories. And I might have missed one or two little microscopic Figment appearances, but overall, his canon, his timeline has been this. Born in 1910, he's over 120 years old now. He has journeyed across multiple dimensions to make his way to all places, a swamp in Florida to entertain you. What would be your imaginary friend if you had to imagine up a figment? If you got to put on the mesmonic converter and dream up everything that you could possibly dream, what sort of imaginary companion would pop up next to you? Let me know in the comments. Let me know all of your favorite figment facts and stories. And when you've met figment and Dreamfinder, your favorite times on the rides, what version of the ride has been your favorite? Tell me all of your figment stories. And of course, you can find me across all of the holy social media channels, including Instagram, Patreon, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, don't forget our super fun vlog, Please Stop Vlogging, where Kenny and I take it to the streets and have all kinds of wacky adventures. Thanks so much for watching, guys. And as always, you don't just rock, you're my little spark of inspiration. Every single one of you. Thanks so much, guys.